Okay, so Manji asked me to address citrus disease management of, or a canopy disease management of citrus and three topics that I'll be talking about. As Osger mentioned, the first one I'm going to be talking about is citrus black spot. And I think I did not include any symptom pictures, but because uh, Osger um, mentioned them, I'm going to uh, just quickly look at these here. This is probably one of the symptoms that's more likely than not to be seen in the field and probably not the one that's going to be most confused with leprosis, but this is citrus hard spot. This is the hard spot symptom. So it's a small lesion. It's less than a quarter of an inch in diameter. It's got a depression to it. And there is, uh, it's um, necrotic or dead in the center. And then you might see little pinpoints, which is the fungal structures growing in the middle. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a good photo, I think, with me uh, of, um, of cracked spot, which is probably the lesion type that you're most likely to uh, see uh, being confused with leprosis, and that's because it tends to be larger. It'll often be flat with raised cracks in the middle, which is something that you would not see from leprosis, and it also tends to have a darker brown color. Uh, leprosis and melanose and other such things tend to have that reddy brown rusty color, whereas black spot does not. Uh, it tends to be now all things are, you know, we always see variation, but um, it tends to have that uh, more chocolate brown color. So uh, black spot is sometimes a popular topic and sometimes it's not, uh, but it is still here in the state of Florida. It's still percolating sort of sometimes under the radar, sometimes not. Um, it's caused by a fungal pathogen, a true fungus, Phyllostichta citricarpa. Uh, it can cause up to 60% yield loss. Fortunately, we've never seen that here in, in uh, Florida from fruit drop in severe situations in other countries where the, the, the grower has chosen not to do much management. More commonly though, the fruit drop levels tend to be about 10 to 20% in a block where they're just putting out a couple sprays a year. Uh, we haven't seen much more than about 10% fruit drop in any of the things that I've worked on so far. So I'm hoping that we can always keep under those levels because we just don't have enough fruit to be dropping them on the ground for something that we could manage. Uh, if you're producing fresh fruit, this is probably more of a concern, more of a headache for you, uh, particularly if you're falling in one of the quarantine areas, the quarantine counties for export, because there do, they then become rules and export restrictions to places like the EU. Um, and then it also can drop you into quarantine where you are having to tarp your loads, which I know is extremely unpopular. Um, and so everybody would like to avoid that as much as possible, including me. So current locations for this disease, we are still uh, in the five Southern counties of this area, mostly in commercial groves. This is sort of our original area here in Collier County, uh, spreading then into Hendry over time. And then it slowly moved its way north and then up into Charlotte and Glades County most recently. Uh, in 2019, we unfortunately had a residential find in Western Lee County. Uh, this has then since expanded in that area. There have been subsequent finds amongst urban citrus in that area. So it does show that that's been there a while and it could be a sort of a lingering problem. Um, uh, but I know the USDA is doing a lot of, they're the ones that are responsible for, for urban, um, urban scouting and they're, they're really focusing in on that problem trying to keep us all uh, safe. What about Hurricane Ian? Well, the effects of Ian at this point are pretty uncertain. We know that winds passed through the areas with CBS. Did that move it to anywhere further up north? Uh, well, we don't really know and it'll be hard to tell for a few years. Uh, hopefully not. Um, you know, there were fines in Lee, Charlotte and Glades County after Irma. Uh, was that actually from Hurricane Irma or was that a coincidence? We do know that it expanded quite a bit in, in Charlotte and Glades County after Irma, but coincidence and actual proof are not necessarily, you know, you can't uh, just assume. Uh, it could be that there were other underlying factors because we don't truly understand how this organism is spreading as far as it is all by itself. But the best policy is if you're in a Northern area, uh, Northeastern area, 
you know, where the, the prevailing winds from Ian went. The best policy if for you, if you don't have the disease, is to be vigilant for the disease and keeping an eye out to make sure that you don't get it. Or if you do, you manage it. So how to scout for CBS. So that's the first thing. And this would work for the diseases that Oscar talked about, the uh, chlorotic yellow vein virus. I can't remember its whole name, sorry. Um, and leprosis virus, I always get that one wrong. Um, you know, for CBS, you would wanna wait for color break or about a month after harvest. Uh, you wanna visit multiple locations within the grove or a block. Um, for CBS, the disease tends to be found in clusters. I'm pretty sure that's the same for leprosis because of how the brevipalpus might move. So I'm not so sure about the other virus. Um, so you'd be looking at, so you'll find areas of multiple trees with a small, so have small number of trees with disease and then everything else surrounding it tending to have nothing. Um, you want to look at particular areas of interest if you've got just limited time along roads, near staging areas for equipment or fruit truck, anywhere that, that debris might commonly be dragged in or dropped. Um, uh, declining trees also tend to have more disease in the early season. So say you're scouting in January, February, uh, your declining trees are the ones that we're probably gonna see more disease more quickly so they're easier to find. And then you can start looking around. Uh, sunny side of the trees early in the season tend to express the symptoms first. This doesn't mean that the trees are Uninfected on the other side of the tree, it just means that they're showing up on the one side uh, first, so often on the um, western side. Uh, you're not in a survey area for, for a chirp, uh, but you are concerned. First thing I would do is learn and recognize, to learn to recognize the symptoms and do your own scouting. Uh, um, training your grove workers to do that. We can always help train um, we haven't had a lot of requests for that, but we still offer that service if, if, if uh, desired. Um, contact CHIRP. You can also arrange for a multi-pest survey on your property. They are responsive to that if you feel like you have a problem. That's how the initial, initial find was made. Somebody made a phone call to CHIRP and said, I've got something weird in my grove. Uh, so, um, and sure enough, they had a problem. Uh, looking at potential scouting patterns, I've got my little green dots here. Uh, those green dots, each one of those signifies three to four rows, so I wouldn't expect anyone to travel up and down every row. That would be tedious. Um, we don't love doing that either. Um, sampling the occasional tree, sort of so you have an X pattern, so that you're sort of trying to hit as many spots in the grove without being too inefficient. Um, probably best done on something like a gator or on foot, but uh, if you can manage to scout from your truck, then all the better. Um, looking at fungicide programs for this disease, uh, our currently recommended products are list, still listed in the 2021-2022 Florida Citrus Production Guide. We haven't changed them because we hadn't had the trial results uh, to add anything to our, our recommendations. I'm hoping that the evaluating our trial results that we'll be able to maybe look at adding additional products for you to use, particularly in terms for rotation. Um, so a copper is always a good basis for your, for your disease program. Um, it also will, will uh, be useful for your, for your canker if you've got a canker problem that you're concerned with. You know, the early oranges tend to get really badly affected by canker some years. Um, or if you've got grapefruit, which is also susceptible to black spot. Um, and then alternating that with something like a strobilurin fungicide, uh, one of the premix fungicides that often contain a strobilurin or enable. Um, it's preferable, as I said, to alternate amongst those modes of action. So our, stro our basic strobilurin fungicides are a bound gem and headline. Our premixes are pristine. Uh, premixes, these ones all contain a strobilurin. Um, pristine, which is, contains an SDHI fungicide, Amistar Top, which contains a DMI, and Preaxor, which contains an SDHI. Coverage is also important for this disease, so you can't just gallop down the, down the row at five miles an hour. Um, you need to slow down uh, to at least three miles an hour and then uh, at least 125 gallons because you're trying to get within the canopy, although some of our canopies are pretty thin these days. Looking at fungicide timing, uh, all citrus is vulnerable to this disease. 
but we really see symptoms in the late hanging sweet oranges. And I think that's because there's more time for the fruit to develop symptoms. You know, we take the hamlins off before they can, they can uh, grow, uh, grow uh, or form symptoms. And now we don't have that many of the early oranges these days. They're, they've really suffered from HLB. Um, the goal is to maintain our coverage on the fruit. Um, minimum months of once a month applications for best control. Mm -hmm. If you're using copper, I would recommend probably a three week interval uh, because of the uh, degradation of the copper shell on the, on the surface of the fruit. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, starting in May, uh, if you've got problems, uh, if it is dry in April, we know that the spores are coming out in April. There's symptoms on the fruit. Uh, we get do get fruit to fruit movement of the uh, fungus when we have late hanging fruit. Um, you know, if if we got a lot of rain in April, but April is usually our dry month, so that's usually we don't need to put out that. But looking at going from May through to August or September uh, to try and keep the fruit as much on the tree as possible. So uh, Oscar and I uh, managed to get out another CBS trial in 2021-2022 season. We did not manage to do that this last year because the grove that we had been working in, unfortunately, had the water turned off just before we were about to initiate the trial. And that didn't allow us time to find a new site, unfortunately. That's just the way life is. Um, so we had been undertaking work in this grove. This trial was undertaken in, in a 20 plus year old Valencia grove, which we knew had good historic uh, infections. The trees were evaluated for black spot symptoms on the fruit before the trial, because we know that it's very variable. So we kind of have to take that into account. Um, we did that on March 24th of 2021, and we looked at 50 fruit per tree. Uh, we tried to then use that initial rating to make the disease levels in the treatments as equivalent as possible. You'll see that that maybe worked better than, sometimes than others. Um, we had, and we looked, we did applications, or Osgur's group did applications of the fungicides uh, at the end of May, June, July, August, and September, and we applied those with a handgun. We got away with that May timing because it was a very dry spring. Um, if it had been a much wetter spring, we would have probably not succeeded as well. Um, and then we evaluated the trial again, again, 50 fruit per tree on March 18th, 2022. So here's our pre-treatment levels. Um, we tried to, to uh, um, equilibrate the, the rates amongst all the, all the trees. We have a reasonable amount of disease in the block, maybe not quite as much as I would like, but certainly reasonable. Uh, however, uh, we had to work with what we could find, and so some things ended up with a lot of disease. Uh, and we assigned these treatments at random here. Um, so uh, we did our best, and then I took account of this when I did my final analysis. I didn't just ignore this data. I then added that into the analysis, um, and I think it didn't make any difference, so then I took it back out. Um, looking at what we did did look at, so we evaluated Moravis Top, which is a newer product, uh, which is a combination of an SDHI, the pi diphenmethylin, and diphenaconazole, which is a DMI. Amistar Top, which is azoxystrobin and diphenaconazole, so that's, uh, uh, the azoxystrobin is a strobilurin. Uh, Enable, which is a straight DMI, fenbuconazole. Uh, we looked at copper, rotated at 3.5 3 pounds, uh, rotated with a thyme oil called Trillium um, at 1.5% uh, volume to volume. Uh, Luna Sensation, which is a strobular and trifloxystrobin and fluopyram. Uh, the SDHI, Luna Experience, which is fluopyram, that's the SDHI, and Tebuconazole, which is the DMI. Cosite, <coughs> excuse me, uh, looked at Cosite 3000, then rotated with PHD which again is the copper um, and the polyoxin D or a zinc salt, which is basically a soap compound, uh, a salt. Um, Preaxor, which is pyracostrobin and fluxopyroxide, uh, another strobilurin and uh, SDHI. Coside 3000, just rotated with headline, uh, common uh, strobilurin that people use. Um, we looked at 
a unknown compound with a non-ionic surfactant, which was actually put out every other treatment. So it only got three of the treatments, not uh, five. Uh, and that was an un unknown compound. Um, that we looked at that then unknown compound with headline, combined with headline, it's still put out every other. Um, uh, then galvanized, which is a polyketide nutrient blend, 811, which was an unknown compound, and COSIDE 3000 rotated with headline and an adjuvant known as Good Spray 1, um, and then an untreated control to compare everything to. So I know that's a huge number of treatments. It was certainly a lot of work for Osgur's group. Um, so just to point out, this is where our untreated control fell. Um, and everything above the untreated control either was equivalent to the untreated control or did not perform as well as the untreated control. Um, this is the third time I think we have tried Luna Experience. It was reported to do well in Brazil. Uh, it's not a registered compound here in Florida uh, or in the uh, if on citrus. And I don't think we'll try it again. It really doesn't hold up. Uh, it almost seems to promote the, the disease. And we've had that result consistently over the few years. Um, now we did have uh, pretty reasonable results from the headline and cosine alternations. Everything from here down is performing significantly better than the control. Uh, I also want to point out we had a sort of we didn't have quite as a disappointing uh, season as the um, last time we'd run a trial where we had very light disease, but it was still pretty light. Um, and that was because of that very dry spring and summer. Um, we just didn't see the amount of disease uh, that we would have expected. Now, of course, because we weren't able to run the trial this last year, we had a good season for black spot. Um, when looking at new sites to establish Grove, I found some excellent um, locations that will probably work quite well next year, hopefully, um, or this season, I should say. So looking at headline and co-side, uh, Luna Sensation did pretty well. Enable is a good stalwart. I would certainly include uh, enable in my rotation. G304 uh, and the NIS did better with the headline included. So I, that gives me the conclusion that probably the headline is doing the heavy lifting there. Um, headline with the good spray one did do a little bit better, but not numerically, I would say, than, than the headline without the, the adjuvant. Um, Preaxor looks reasonable, certainly. Uh, PhD and COSIDE, that gives us a new mo mode of action. It's fully registered for citrus. Um, and so that, that looks pretty promising. I would certainly recommend that to be included in, in, a, uh, in a rotation. The Trillium looked promising. I would like to try that one again. Uh, that time oil, I wasn't expecting a huge amount out of the Trillium, uh, but I was pleasantly surprised. So I think it's worth at least looking at one more time. Um, and then Amistar Top uh, is again, doing pretty well on, um, on citrus black spot. So it's good to see that as we get greater amounts of disease in the grove, the reason we keep testing some of these is that when we did some of our earliest recommendations, we didn't have a whole lot of disease. And so we were kind of holding our nose going, I really hope that this is gonna prove to be the way it looks in our preliminary uh, trials. So looking at management for other than, than uh, fungicides, which I would certainly recommend using, um, managing your leaf litter to enhance the effect of the fungicide program. We've had good results out of the product called soil set um, or composting, uh, particularly where this disease is less severe. Uh, yeah, but I would say if you only have a few trees, this is probably not something that I would initiate it at that time, I would wait till my disease became more severe. Um, removing as much dead wood as possible, the fungus survives within dead twigs uh, and produces spores. Uh, so looking at hedging would probably be very helpful. Um, practice vehicle and equipment decontamination when you're leaving your affected sites. You don't need to be the, the black spot fairy taking it from one location to another. You don't need your staff or your equipment to be doing it. And you certainly don't want a contractor bringing it in. Um, if you are, uh, so if you reduce or eliminate your CBS program, you go, oh, I've got it under control. I don't need to worry about this problem anymore. We know from 
from what previous growers have done is that once they take their foot off the accelerator in terms of control, it pops back up and usually it's worse than it was before because it's been percolating through the leaves growing in the canopy uh, and we've been keeping it suppressed by uh, fungicides or whatever else that the grower is doing. And, and we just haven't been able to see it visually. I'm gonna move over to citrus canker. Um, here we have some uh, stem lesions just because uh, Oscar was uh, mentioning um, leprosis. You know, our stem lesions tend to be quite uh, raised as he mentioned. Uh, and also often you'll see water soaking at those earlier stages around those stem lesions. And that's again, something that uh, leprosis doesn't have. Um, and if it's really raised, it's probably canker and, and not much else causes those kinds of symptoms when it gets to be really raised. So the life cycle of canker, uh, you, as, as we all remember, we've got windblown rain. Uh, it's carrying the inoculum from things like our stem lesions in the early season. Um, leaf, leaves are not really contributing so much to that. Uh, the bacteria levels are really low in the leaves in the early spring, but the stem cankers can produce uh, bacteria, viable bacteria for up to four years. That's why they are such a problem and they are hard to see. Um, but the wind can find them, the wind and rain, they pick it up and in some of these big events, it just forces it straight into the leaves. Ian, that's what Ian did. It just threw it straight into the, into the leaves and, and then uh, no matter what you would have had on the surface of the plant, nothing would have stopped the bacteria from getting in and then starting to grow. But in normal circumstances, in just like a, uh, a uh, thunderstorm, it'll pick it up, it'll move it in. Um, it waterlogs the stomates on the fruit and the leaves and twigs. Then the bacteria can either, is either forced in partially, but also can swim a short ways. Then we get lesions, of course. Wounding is, a, is always a problem. That's another thing we saw from we, Ian. Of course, you get thorn, wind, thorn punctures all over the place from the wind damage. And those are all vulnerable to canker as well. Uh, we get rainfall coming through again. They wet the lesions, the bacteria then ooze back out like a little bacterial volcano and they get picked up and moved again. And the whole cycle will continue until the tissue is no longer vulnerable um, because it's either aged out or uh, has fallen off. So fruit susceptibility to canker. Um, the fruit are most susceptible from three eighths of an inch on oranges until the fruit le uh, reach about 1.5 inches in diameter. Um, rains in April, May, and June really promote that early season infection on the fruit. Uh, and our rind becomes more resistant as we on oranges as we hit that 1.5 inches in diameter. That does not mean that they can't be infected. It just means that the lesions aren't quite as devastating. They don't get as big. They tend not to knock the fruit off. So at that point, you can probably relax if you're growing just for juice production. If you're going for fresh, that's a whole different story. Uh, but for juice production, you can probably be less concerned about canker after that point. The rind does remain susceptible throughout that full growth period, but, um, and we're no longer sort of giving you a time when to put out your copper sprays for, um, for canker because we get so many different waves of flowering these days with the stress of the trees, but also like this year, we're probably going to see several waves of flowers because we saw flower induction happening in October with those first early, um, cool periods. And so we're going to have multiple waves of flowering. So what you need to do is get out and look at your average diameter on your trees and see what makes sense for your grove. And if you hit that three eighths of an inch uh, and you have a problem with canker um, and it's February, then you probably should be thinking about um, putting out an application if we're going to get rain. We tend to get rain through February. It's sort of Tap sort of turns off in mid-March, right when we hit the bloom, thank goodness. And then it picks up again afterwards. Um, so these are things are all things to uh, consider when you, when you are planning, planning your programs uh, and, and how to manage some of these things. Uh, as, as I mentioned, size really does matter in this. It's not so much the timing, but the size of the fruit. Um, you need that 21 day interval to protect the fruit. Uh, it's very important very hard to keep canker down on the leaves. Um, we do occasionally recommend 
uh, especially in younger groves uh, in a year like this year, putting out in early February, starting a blockade program to try and suppress the canker and the stem lesions from producing too many bacteria, keeping the leaf inoculum down because that leaf inoculum that we get in early season will sometimes set up the uh, year for, for canker. Um, now we are predicted to get less rain this spring, so that may be our saving grace after Ian. Uh, let's hope so. Spray volume and tractor speed are important for again for fruit coverage. Uh, that's sort of a mantra for most of the fungal foliar diseases. So please slow down uh, when you're putting out uh, fungicide. That copper residue is significantly reduced by rain washing. Um, I keep coming back to this because I get questions periodically. Um, copper does not move once it's dried, uh, no matter what somebody will tell you. The copper residue is cracked by fruit growth once it's there, and uh, so then it leaves those spots in between the copper uh, plaques uh, that are vulnerable. Um, there's still always the copper model if you don't want to schedule when your sprays are, are going to be. Um, I know that some of the larger operations that can be very tricky, but if you have the flexibility and you have particular blocks that you're interested in managing, the copper model is a good, uh, good way to determine whether your residue is insufficient towards an upcoming rain. Um, as that fruit grows, it must be reapplied. The copper must be reapplied continually to cover the fruit as it becomes larger. Um, looking at all the coppers, we recommend looking at the label rate. There are so many coppers out there, it's hard to really make a, uh, and they all recommend different amounts and they know their products best. So it's good to look at the label, read for that particular copper and a disease because there will be different amounts recommended for disease. Um, being cautious in hot weather, every year I get fruit come in or pictures, what's happened to my fruit? Uh, and they're all black and they're gnarly and they're falling off the tree. And it's usually somebody's made a mistake in a tank mix and they've put copper in something else on a hot day and all the fruit are now burnt beyond recognition. And the person is very sad because there are no more fruit. They're all raining down on the ground. Um, and I, that's even sometimes the occasional experienced grower will have this problem. So the, to try and reduce phytotoxicity concerns, particularly in hot weather, greater volume, uh, water volume per acre, avoiding those complex tank mixes, don't mix copper and oil. Uh, nutritional materials sometimes if they drop your acidity, that means in the tank, that means you're more likely to have a phytotoxicity problem. And uh, we don't recommend aerial applications with things like copper because you just don't get the canopy penetration you need with, with canker. Also, depending on the copper, it very, very well uh, clog everything up. So uh, looking back at some older data, um, hoping to have some newer data in this next year, but looking at eight-year-old Ray Ruby trees down in, in uh, Bureau Beach, uh, which did have uh, windbreaks all around it. Uh, they started, trial was started sort of during the COVID-19 shutdown. And uh, because of all the logistic challenges that happened in that time, uh, the first application didn't go out till June. Um, they were making applications at 145 gallons per acre. Uh, and you can see that they put out starting in June 1st, um, June 22nd, every three weeks, all the way to October 26th. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, the copper, it was another very dry spring. I remember this spring being quite dry uh, in Lake Alfred, and obviously it was down on the, on the East Coast as well. Uh, and so we didn't see very high uh, canker incidence in general. You can see here, here's our untreated control. And despite the fact that there was only one general copper spray put on by the grower in May, and then starting in June, uh, the fruit incidence was still only 12%. And gr grapefruit, as everybody knows, is just a magnet for canker. Um, most treatments uh, in this particular trial were some experimental products so, so the treatments really don't matter but what is interesting is that everything worked as well equivalent to copper and you can see we're using a 1.5 pound acre rate because we're finding that those higher rates for canker really aren't necessary um, uh, so everything came out to be about under two percent for all the incidents um, and including uh, and that didn't unfortunately include any of the fruit that dropped because of canker and 
there were some logistical challenges with that. It wasn't possible to collect the fruit drop data, unfortunately. Um, now you're probably saying, okay, so what? Um, well, this, this, as I said, was a very dry spring. Uh, here, this is the, in uh, red is the 2020 uh, rainfall, and then this is the average of the four years before. And you can see we had less rainfall in January, equivalent in February, no rainfall in March. Um, and then April, it's, it, it picked up a little bit. May again was lower. June was normal. And then the summer was dry. And then we had another rainfall in October. Um, that dry March really helped to keep the leaf inoculum low. That early season inoculum um, <clears throat> is what spreads to the fruit later. Uh, after it's been infected from those stem lesions, then the leaves get going. They produce a lot more inoculum during the season. Stem lesions are what carries it from season to season. Um, and, uh, and also then the dry, drier than usual summer kept the disease incidences low. Um, but more interestingly, I think here is looking at the yield, uh, yield effects. So here we have our untreated control again, and, and then all of our random compounds and our 1.5 pounds per acre. So even though we got started off at a bad sort of way, starting in June, we were saved a little bit by the weather, we do see that we were able to improve our uh, yield by 10 to 15 pounds per tree, which is fairly significant, especially in a day where we're having trouble keeping fruit on the trees. So canker control is, helps keeping our fruit for harvest. This is important. Um, and, but, and just as a reminder, not just HLB is causing yield reduction. All of those other things are nibbling away at profit uh, and causing our yields to go down. So looking at post-bloom fruit drop, this was sort of the boogeyman a few years ago. Um, I'm pleased to say that we haven't seen so much of it recently. Um, our, our, this, this is another fungal disease. It's prefer, uh, caused by colotogicum acutatum, or sometimes it's now called ab colotogicum abscism. The preferred climate is a humid subtropical climate. This fungus moves with rain splash and windborne rain. Uh, human activities will also move it, things like equipment and workers can also, with the petals on them, can move the fungus from one location to another. Picking bags can be bad. Um, possible movement with young trees, that's been documented in Brazil. And uh, disease is more severe in areas with multiple blooms. So, or if you're, or varieties that you're growing with multiple blooms, like a navel, um, because you get different waves of blooms. Uh, and those multiple blooms are often promoted by other diseases like HLB. So here are some of the symptoms, uh, classical symptoms here. You can see the necrotic uh, petals, they're, go they're sort of orangey brown. Um, see that some of these uh, fruitlets are, are starting to decline. Here we see the very classic salmon colored spores on the petals. Here you can see a fruitlets already dropped clusters where the fruitlets were dropped uh, with some fruitlets still right, waiting to drop. Uh, and, and the fungus can affect one or two flowers and cause other fruitlets to drop, even though those flowers weren't directly affected sometimes if it's bad enough. You see the leaf twisting here on this uh, caused by the fungus itself. Um, and so uh, we can get pretty bad uh, yield effects from, from uh, colotogicum or PFD. Fortunately, we haven't seen any of this in the last few years because the weather hasn't been right. Um, so the way this disease works, uh, we have persistent calyces uh, and the inoculum comes actually off the leaves, the twigs, and sometimes a little bit off the calyces. Uh, I think it was Steve Futch did a little study back in the 19, late 1990s where P, when PFD was a really bad problem. And he spent the time to cut all the buttons off a tree and they still managed to get PFD in the following years. Um, so it just shows you that the buttons are really not so much a source of inoculum, but a symbol that you need to pay attention to what's going on. Um, anyway, those spores that are sort of in this resting phase, they, they germinate with, with the new bloom. They're stimulated to, to germinate by the uh, flowers. They grow and you get very small numbers of spores, but those spores are enough to infect that emerging set of flowers. Those flowers then become infected. They become the inoculum source. So they start to grow that profusion of, of spores um, and they infect the next round of flowers. 
in these specialized structures that produce many, many more spores. And then as long as you've got rain and flowers, that cycle keeps going until the flowering is done. And it has been recorded in Florida that you can get up to 80% fruit loss uh, from this disease. And so we try and keep an eye on it to make sure that we don't have a problem. So the fungus, as I said, survives on the leaves, leaf surfaces, twigs, and the buttons, those, special, those uh, persistent calyces uh, in the specialized fungal structures. Those structures then germinate and form new spores with, for moisture and petal extracts. The spores are dispersed to new flowers via rain splash, and they germinate in moisture within 12 to 24 hours, and they can infect in 24 to 48 hours. Um, and new symptoms and spores are then present again in four to five days. So for a fungal disease, it's a pretty rapid turnaround. Bacteria, that would be nothing, but for a fungus, that's really rapid. Um, so looking at the climate forecast for winter in 2022-2023, uh, so we're obviously into the 2023, this is the consensus forecast of the, uh, from Erie, uh, looking at the probability of the La Nina weather pattern. So we're sort of in this period where we're declining out of the La Nina and into sort of a more neutral pattern uh, as, as sort of a weak, described as a weak La Nina as I was investigating this the other day. Um, Unfortunately, the new forecast won't be out till Thursday this week to sort of see what they have found or what have they've determined uh, from the weather pattern so far. Um, but uh, the La Nina pattern is most, is, as I said, is coming into a neutral pattern or predicted to be into a neutral pattern by the time we get into our critical period for, um, for PFD management, which is really targeting that main bloom, uh, usually happening in March. And if we have a lot of trickle bloom that gets infected prior to that, then we may be having a problem even in a dry year because we are expected to have higher than average temperatures, which favors PFD, but rainfall is predicted to be what uh, quite a bit below average, uh, which does not favor PFD, but it only takes a couple rain events at key times. So it's worth keeping an eye on it, uh, but probably not planning on seeing a huge amount of problem with it. But I do get calls every year from certain regions that have uh, just the wrong time of wetness. Uh, like I know I got a lot of calls from the Sebring area recent or last year, and they were the only ones that seemed to have a real problem with PFD. Um, looking at your fungicide application timing, timing really for this disease is critical. You can't just mess around. You really have to have good timing with this disease. Um, and just sort of going, oh, well, when the tractor gets there, that's not going to work for PFD. So if you've got blocks that you need to keep an eye on, you really need to be on top of it. We recommend using the citrus application scheduler to time this. Uh, we've demonstrated now um, that, uh, that it does time the, the applications well. It makes good recommendations that do affect the fruit number of fruit. Um, and uh, we don't expect, as I said, to need treatments in most locations this season, uh, but the, and the tool is very good at determining when the applications are not needed. So even if you're not expecting it, you may just want to keep an eye on it, check it periodically, have it send you uh, uh, reminders that, or predictions of when, when there might be an infection period for those key blocks where you think you might have a problem. Um, and it could say, you know, even, so some people I know just like to go out and prolap, pro, prophylactically spray for this disease. And that isn't a great idea because of problems with fungicide resistance potentially. Uh, so we really want you to conserve as many sprays as possible for only when they're critically needed. Um, so looking at control options, you know, the traditional one is to remove declining trees, but that would be probably removing whole blocks. Um, sometimes you could get away with HLB affected branches only, uh, but that sort of window is sort of passing as well. Uh, really, we're, we're basing a lot of our management on the fungicides. Um, we tested a lot of different products over the years for uh, PFD. Uh, I've stopped doing trials right now because it's hard for me to find blocks where you have consistent disease. But um, we did not find anything that's working better than the strobular and fungicides. Those are a bound gem and headline. Um, we all, that included the premixes, uh, Amistar Top, Prestige, and Preaxor. The reason I like those is not so much because they're working better, but because they have those alternate 
modes of action. So at least we're getting some rotation. Um, if we are expecting a high alert, so that's when the little circle turns red, um, it is probably best to combine those with FURBAM. We tend to get a better reduction in disease with the FURBAM. Um, however, uh, just something to keep an eye on. Uh, FURBAM has, is under the process of being reviewed and evaluated by the EPA. And they are considering withdrawing the registration of FURBAM for citrus entirely. And so that's still ongoing process. I, I know I, I've done some work to try and help um, make the industry's argument for keeping it as a back, backup uh, for, for PFD and a couple other diseases. Um, so there, but they also I wanna keep, have you keep in mind, there are strict label limits for these fungicides. So for the strobulurins, you, you're not, not supposed to be putting out more than four applications for any purpose within the year, but you've noticed I've talked about them a lot. So that's one reason we want to try and keep them in our back pockets and not use them when we don't need them. Um, so you mentioned the reason I like the, the premixes, it's not so much for their greater efficacy against PFD. Uh, we do see great, you know, good efficacy, uh, but we found this was pretty much equivalent to the strobulurins alone, but they do contain those rotational modes of action to try and buy us a little bit more time. It took Colototricum accutatum in strawberry a while to develop resistance to the strobulurins, but it did eventually happen. And we don't have any backups right now in citrus for this disease if we lose the strobulurins. Uh, I will continue to look at evaluate new products uh, as they come available and I have disease to try them on, but at the moment we don't have anything else. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about is algal spot. This is not a fungus, it's an algae. Um, it's a, it was a historical problem. Occasionally I would get a random question, probably once every five years. And then all of a sudden my phone started to blare up over this disease. Um, so the most of the management information is from the late sixties and early seventies on this disease. I spent a lot of time looking in the old, old, old literature. Um, and it's not, has not frequently been seen in groves until recently. Uh, mostly described as being minor on anything but lemons and limes, and we don't grow a huge number of those. Um, usually this disease could be managed with routine, improved grove maintenance. I suspect, and copper applications were recommended as a control agent, and what I suspect was happening is that people were improving the canopy health by keeping the leaves back on the trees, it was shading out the algae on the, on the limbs, and voila, you've solved the problem, and you've got better yield probably at the same time. Um, so it was considered to be a non-existent problem, except for in occasional uh, instances. Uh, however, everything I've read so far, and I will continue to try and keep up with going, what's going on in this disease, is that this disease is becoming more and more of a problem, not just in citrus, but in other things. And it is likely to intensify, intensify as a problem as, as we get increased average temperatures over time, which of course is happening with, with climate change. Um, and not something we wanna see. But it is associated with tree stress. Of course, warmer temperatures will stress the trees by itself. Um, uh, but on multiple hosts, you see it on, on uh, stressed or declining trees. Of course, we have a lot of stressed and declining trees in Florida for citrus. Um, you know, one of the hypotheses was that only healthy plants are able to form defensive structures. I'm not sure that's true if there's something else going on. Um, Reducing that plant, plant stress through cultural practices is recommended, you know, following whatever the most current um, recommendations are for optimal nutrition and irrigation. Um, and then other disease and pest management problems. This is caused by the organism Cephalorus virescens. Um, it doesn't appear to get nutrients from the tree directly. We don't really understand what's going on with it. It's a very understudied disease. Uh, it does cause the death of, of epidermal and palisade cells of the leaves under what they call the body of the, or the thallus of the algae. But how it infects bark was really unclear. I couldn't find any information about that in the literature. That's a big black box. Um, the early infections are difficult to detect. Um, they don't contain the bright pigment that, that really defines algal spot. It's not visible to the naked eye eat sometimes. Uh, normally at the cuticle at the early stages starts to get 
slight, slightly wiggly, uh, but that's really hard to see, even if you're looking for it. Um, so it's really tricky to determine when those infections occur. Um, and then it also will overlap large areas when multiple, the tick of large areas when the multiple colonies overlap. As I said, it has a broad host range. It's been observed on 287 different plant species and invaded stems on at least 80 of them. Um, selection, so some of the other economically important crops, avocado, blackberry, blueberry, grapes, common guava, lychee nut, magnolia, mango, timber trees. Um, so it could potentially be a real problem if it ever gets out of the way. So here's uh, where we started to see some of the more recent in, uh, researches in blackberries. It's causing a big blackberry problem in, in, uh, in uh, Georgia, and then also avocado uh, in Hawaii, magnolia here. I think I took that picture out of my yard. Um, canopy symptoms, uh, they're the most consequential symptom type here uh, in Florida on citrus. The lesions are usually a half inch in diameter, but as I said, they coalesce or join. So they end up covering most of a branch in sort of a sheath. Uh, they occur on branches, particularly the scaffold limbs. Uh, and most of the year, the lesions are sort of a subtle gray green color. Uh, so that makes it really difficult to spot. Is it lichen? Is it this? Um, but the bark te texture sometimes is, uh, get a bark texture difference. But again, that's really sort of hard to spot. And the initial symptoms are thickened bark sections around the leaves. So again, something that's not obvious. So it's entirely forgivable if you don't spot it early. Uh, lesions are cracked, the bark falls off, you get small pieces or shreds. Uh, if those conditions are favorable, the scaffold limbs up to two inches can be killed. So that's a pretty major chunk of your tree. You can also get limbs stunting with chlorotic leaves and leaf drop. Uh, lesions are most visible when they're fruiting, which occurs between June and September, but I've seen reports of all the way into October, December. So uh, maybe as we warm up, uh, the, the fung or the, I want to call it a fungus, the algae is, um, the algae is less constrained by temperatures. Um, colonies become orange red to dark red with a texture like velvet. There's really nothing else that I've seen out there that looks like it and will often have a donut appearance with gray centers surrounded by the red fruiting structures. So here's what I'm talking about. Um, so you can see here, uh, these fruiting structures around this gray center. You can see why that's so hard to see for most of the year. Um, you can see some bark cracking in through here, uh, taking out good chunks of bark there. That, and the, you know, there's nothing contiguous there so that that branch is likely to, to fail. Here's some more bark cracking you can see caused by the, by the algae. Uh, just more examples. This really dark red is actually the paint we were using to define our areas um, for measurement. And then you can see this whole branch is sort of involved. Um, fruit and leaf symptoms, generally less severe than tree symptoms. Uh, the fruit lesions are dark black and easily removed by brushing. I've only seen this a few times in the field and I always grab it when I see it. They're circular to irregularly shaped under magnification. They're very highly branched, almost fern-like, um, mostly seen on the overripe fruit still on the tree. So probably that piece of fruit that didn't was off season and still left on the tree. Um, raised lesions occur on either side of the leaf. I have never seen the leaf symptoms in citrus. Uh, minor chlorosis around the leaves and they will eventually flake off leaving a depression. So that's probably why I've never spotted it. So here are the uh, fruit symptoms. You can see it's kind of distinctive. Uh, you might mistake it for something else like melanose if you were far away, but as you get closer and you look at those, those uh, um, lesions, you can see they've got those feathery margins, uh, especially if you had a, a hand lens like we're giving away out at the back, you would really see that for sure that that was not something that you were terribly familiar with and you might wanna go look to see what it might be and you'll hit upon uh, algal spot pretty quickly. And then here are these uh, elusive leaf symptoms that I've yet to see, uh, but fortunately somebody managed to get a photo of. So we did a trial in 20, well, we've done a trial now, I think three times. Uh, we did, did one in 2021 on Valencia trees that were approximately at this point, eight years old, had a history of algal spot. Um, the applications were made with handgun, really ensuring that the wood was wetted till runoff. Um, application timing was looking at a dormant spray in early February, 
post bloom on May 7th, and then when the fruiting bodies were visible in, in June, late June. Um, we looked, now because this organism is an algae, it means it's more closely related to Phytophthora than it is uh, to any fungus or plant. Um, and so in discussion with, uh, I think it was John uh, Taylor at the time, uh, we're looking for anything we could try against this product. So that's how we let, alighted upon looking at Rebus, Arondas, and Arondas Ultra, which are all Phytophthora specific products. Also Prophyte, you will recognize the phosphites from um, the battle against Phytophthora. Then we looked at copper, which was that traditional method of applications. And then we looked at timings of Prophyte at 0.5 gallons. So we've got different rates of Prophyte here, uh, one gallon and 0.25 gallons. And then I've got three different timings, only in June, May and June, and then that adding that dormant spray in, because those are the timings that were, that were mentioned in the old literature. And then everything was compared to an untreated control. So here are the trial results. Um, our rating scale, that was based on the coverage of a 12 inch section of branch, remember the red paint. Um, so for the bloom specifically, we had a zero, so no bloom. And then everything else was on a one to five scale from one to 20% to 71 to 100% uh, for five. Um, and you can see for total rating, um, we did see some differences. Here's our control, very cooperatively had the most disease. That was lucky for me. Um, and then uh, a lot of our products did much better than the, than the control. Uh, from here on, we could see a reduction in algal spot, but not a huge, hugely significant difference, or not a huge difference between um, the amount of disease when we looked at the total. And that's uh, when we looked at the amount, though, that was blooming, we could see that we were really having an effect on the bloom when you looked at uh, copper here did some. When I did the first trial, copper did absolutely nothing. So it wasn't consistent. Uh, Prophyte, though, looked really good. And we looked at three different rates, and the 0.5 was the best. Uh, but when we did one time, you can see we have a bit more disease. But Prophyte three times or two times in the year looked pretty well. And Prophyte as a gallon per acre, but it really seemed excessive. We weren't getting any better results than we were at 0.5, so let's save some money and not. Profite at 0.25 gallon gave us good results this year, but it was inconsistent. In 2019, it didn't look as good as the other two rates of Profite, and in 2022, it also didn't look as good. Um, so we found that Profite really was, our, or the phosphites really, I don't think this is anything special about this particular phosphite, uh, as long as it's labeled for a fungicide, um, uh, gave us pretty good results there. When we looked at, again, now the trees are a year older, uh, pretty much the same timings in February, May, and June. Um, sorry. Um, we looked at Prophyte again at 0.25 gallons. Uh, we looked at the three different timings again, just to really see how that was going to perform. Was that a fluke or not? Then we looked at oxidate. I've had a lot of people ask me about oxidate, so we put it in the trial. That's a mixture of peroxidic acid and hydrogen peroxide um, and potassium phosphite, um, and then oxidate by itself. Uh, and then looking again at two of these uh, phytophthora management products, uh, COSI 3000, and then an untreated control. So unfortunately, my um, um, unfortunately my uh, data weren't lining up as nicely to be put on the one graph uh, as it was last year. Uh, so when we looked at the percent area of dead, so percent area dead is a good thing, right? So uh, algal spot. So we could see that the profite uh, used once or twice looked really good. Oxidate seemed to do a lot of, uh, seemed to contribute a fair amount to the death of this organism. Three times is not, you know, again, not significantly different from our best performing treatment. And then, um, and then we can see here, the, here's the control. And we've got a few here. Uh, the, the phytophthora things are not performing any better than the untreated control. And neither was the oxidate with the prophyte in terms of the dead area. But where things I think get particularly interesting, so we're reducing the amount of spread possible, is with the prophytes here more consistently, you can see we had 
uh, pretty good um, pretty good control. Here we've got oxidate and prophyte is looking really good, um, but oxidate by itself is not. So I think most of that is, is, is the prophyte um, in this particular case, uh, which is unfortunate because I'd like another product to, uh, to recommend other than just the phosphites. Um, but uh, you can see that we do at least have some now some options that make a sense for me to recommend uh, as, as a management for this disease is to put out uh, a phosphite program. Um, I seem to be stuck here. Okay, so algal spot recommendations uh, based on the trial results. Uh, the phosphate project, uh, products are giving us the most consistent control over the three years. I've had contradictory results from copper. Uh, um, unfortunately, uh, makes the disease less severe. It reduces the bloom. Uh, much of the effective area that we, we note doesn't appear to be still living. Um, most, we get the most consistent bloom reduction with the three applications. However, um, I think that's really only necessary if you've got a severe problem in one year and then you want to in following years do some uh, maintenance. Uh, two, two applications would certainly be sufficient. If you are the person that wanders along in your grove and you notice at the end of the year when it's blooming, my goodness, I seem to have a problem, I would certainly encourage you to get out that one phosphite application uh, to set yourself up for the next year because it does seem to be fairly efficacious um, in, in reducing the amount of algal spot. So uh, I want to say thank you. Uh, I think we're pretty much out of time, but if we have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. If not, Manji thinks we've got enough time. We have time. Any questions? Well, that's where having it bloom that bright or red orange color is really the key uh, to easily telling the difference. If you look at it really closely and spend a lot of time on it, you can tell the difference. But even I sometimes feel a little squishy on that. Um, so it, it really waiting for that unfortunate bloom period is probably your easiest thing. Um, maybe as I get to know the, the disease a bit better and, and get more visuals, I can maybe help a bit more with that question. But at the moment, it's really that bright red color that's the key. Any questions? You, you mentioned that there are not much studies on to look at how it's uh, infecting the uh, cuticle or the branch um, epidermal cells. But I did see that there was some um, killing of the epidermal cells in the twig. How it's doing this, uh, how do you uh, explain that? I think it's just so understudied that we don't have any good information. And so I'm assuming it probably is putting its uh, hostoria or whatever it's using as a structure into those cells and that that's killing the cells. But I, I, that's just speculation on my part. You haven't studied uh, I have not studied that. Histologically. I have, I have mainly restricted my uh, attention on this disease because it's really, there's not much funding for looking at it to purely um, how to control it in the field, because that's the question that I get the most asked. Thanks. Thank you, Alison, for your help. Thank you, Justin, for your support. So for those who are in the auditorium, they will be getting lunch, good lunch, if you attend in person training or workshops. Thank you, Dr. Batuman. Thank you, Dr. Dwidney. Dwidney. Any last questions or comment? Again, if you are in on Zoom, please send uh, an email to me. 
with your license number if you are interested about CEUs. Thank you all and see you next time.